Well, June, it is up for you, man. I can't wait to uh, hear what you have to, to bless us today. You always bring really cool information and some gems. So bless us now, man. But take it away, June. Right. Well, no, no pressure after that intro, uh, Grant. Um, I actually want to tell a quick story that's related to Livy B. Um, so, you know, I, I've been with Rally since before the launch, right? And it's so great to see how this whole community and project has evolved. I mean, it's just been incredible. Um, but so I told, you know, I told my family about it. It's like, oh, I'm working with this project. It's a really cool project, right? This was last year. And like, oh, okay, it's another crypto thing. Um, and then fast forward a couple of months ago, my younger brother who, who lives in Australia um, and is a fan of Livy B. Uh, what? Says, like, hey, oh you know, there's this B token, right? And he was buying this B token. And I said, well, you know what? Why don't you go to the rally.io website, which is where the B token is from and check out who's on the about page. And he was like, oh my God, what are you doing there? I'm like, I told you about this last year, you know? This, this it wasn't interested is, is then. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That is awesome. Tell so, him I say hi. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we'll do. Um, anyway, he's a big, I think he's a big bee holder and, um, a rally farmer now, so oh. um, he's, he's farming that rally. Um, sweet. So let me try and share my screen. Awesome. So um, just as a quick introduction, uh, I do a bunch of research uh, for Rally, um, and I publish it on the Rally blog uh, un under a, uh, a column called Pace Notes. And sort of the objective of what I do is I look at um, a lot of the um, adjacent uh, uh, literature that's out there uh, in fields like sociology or economics um, that I think uh, have a lot of overlap with what we're trying to build when we talk about social token uh, communities or tokenized communities. Um, so that's kind of the um, general direction of, of the research. Um, and so if I jump from you know discipline to discipline, uh, you'll forgive me, that, that's kind of part of the, it's a feature, not a bug. Um, so in, in recent weeks, I've been um, following the research by a group called um, uh, New Public, and they have a project called Civic Signals. So this was created by um, two people, one of them, uh, Eli Pariser, who you might know from a few years ago, he wrote a book called The Fil Filter Bubble, in which he examined uh, how information gets circulated on social media platforms, right? Like, like Facebook and so on. And you know, the conclusion was um, people end up in, in these bubbles, right? So uh, you don't get a lot of new information that doesn't confirm your, your biases. So I was super interested when he came up with this new project, which was all about how we can sort of reform or rethink uh, digital spaces by using the metaphor of public space, right? So if we think about how for centuries we have built you know, successful public spaces like parks and libraries and other things, um, why can't we apply some of those principles to our new public spaces, which happen to exist on the internet? And I think there's a lot of overlap there with community building uh, in social tokens. So, and, and you can go to newpublic.org um, to see all of the great research there. But so the following is going to be a quick summary of their research, and then I'll, I'll do a few sort of cues on where I think social tokens um, can learn from, from those things. So, you know, these are the things that they say are features of good public spaces, right? So programming, um, you need, there's some kind of editorial input in terms of what your community does, um, visual cues, um, um, accessibility, uh, and a, a, an emphasis on engaging maintainers, right? So not just um, not just people, not, not necessarily just builders uh, or founders, but but people who are maintaining um, a, a particular culture. And this is kind of their kind of their the thought experiment on, you know, imagine if uh, a digital space were were a physical space, right? So this is their thing on Twitter. Um, they kind of say, you know, you, you can read this a little bit, but but the conclusion isn't great, right? You you end up with a metaphor of, you know, if Twitter was transposed into meat space, it would look like a crowded parking lot on a busy shopping day, right? Just a bunch of people in a in a kind of a log jam, shouting each other and trying to be heard over the you know the chaos and the cacophony, um, and it's made worse by things like algorithmic um, amplification. 
So, you know, what does a, a well-designed public space look like? So this is an example they gave. Um, there was a, there's a terrible heat wave in Chicago in 1995. Uh, Eric Kleinberg, who's a sociologist, wrote a book about this heat wave and, and, and sort of examined many aspects of it. Um, almost 800 people died in this heat wave, which is a lot. Um, and so what Kleinberg found was that, you know, those, there was a correlation between those parts of the city that had more public spaces, like libraries and parks, uh, and a reduction in deaths, right, or low number of deaths. And the, I guess the hypothesis of why that happened is because uh, those places with public spaces had the infrastructure to allow uh, citizens to, to get together regularly and thus create a social safety net uh, for, for those people, right? So when the heat wave came, which, uh, you know, the, the most vulnerable die from the heat wave, right? Whether it's the elderly um, or people with disabilities and or people uh, uh, with on, on lower income who can't cool their environment. Um, those people who had spent time in the public spaces had the social safety net to, to check on them and support them and, and ensure that they didn't actually die in the heat wave. Um, so, you know, those are the kind of interesting second order effects of um, uh, the existence of, of public spaces and, and the design of good public spaces. And so the other concept they introduce is this idea of um, user of public friendly design, right? And so they kind of position that in opposition to user friendly design. Like we all know about, you know, the, the objective of kind of the Silicon Valley really uh, is to create, you know, user friendly UIs, right? How can we get you to complete a particular user journey or user flow? Um, and I guess their argument is, you know, what's good for the user may not be good for the group of users, right? So individual well-being is not the same as, as group well-being. Um, and so that requires a slight reframing of how we might think about designing uh, communities, right? From, from, the, from the one to the many. Um, and one of the things that they claim is that, you know, user design is all about removing friction, right? How can you smoothly get people to do certain things? Uh, and they think that good public friendly design uh, is, is not obsessed with uh, friction elimination, right? In, instead, friction can be a useful feature um, to uh, uh, allow some of these uh, social practices and to create, a, allow the knitting of the social fabric uh, to take place. So, you know, friction is not the enemy. Um, and you can go on their website and you can get a lot more info, info on this, but they have a whole framework that they came up with. They rated a bunch of the um, big social media platforms based on this framework. So you can see, you know, based on their research, what they think each of these platforms, whether it's Facebook or Twitter, et cetera, uh, how, how they score uh, according to their framework. But, that research doesn't go, I think, deep enough um, into some of the social token stuff. So, you know, they drill down into some, into some of these specific uh, building blocks of how uh, great public digital public spaces can be built. One of those uh, traits is this idea of cultivating belonging, right? So, um, you know, the tactics and the strategies of how do you actually cultivate belonging in a, in a digital space. Um, so these are some of the takeaways that they came, came away with, um, and they did this through lit, lit research, looking at the sociology and psychology research to see what works in public spaces, and then transposing some of those things to digital. So, it, you know, I think a lot of these principles you can apply uh, to your own creator coin or social token communities, right? For example, um, there's, there's an interesting thing here about um, belongingness, the sense of belongingness, um, tends to be capped, right? So it's a bit like Dunbar's number, where the number of close ties you can have is, uh, is, is, is limited um, uh, for each individual. Uh, and therefore, if you think about building a community, you know, what's better, right? Do you want to build a community of 50,000 people? Or do you want to build one where that, that's smaller, but with deeper ties and, and higher uh, belongingness score? Um, so I think some of these insights are, are very 
um, useful in, in framing how you, what you optimize for when you develop that Pluto token community. And then uh, sort of the next step following the lit trail from there, right, was um, a couple of papers that they base their conclusions on. So one of those papers is a thing from 1975, and it, it's a, a kind of a psychology paper that's called, that, that created a theory called uncertainty reduction theory, right? Which is all about how closely observing how strangers meet and interact. Um, and from there, developing some uh, hypotheses about why they do, did the things they did. And so, you know, this theory says that there's three phases every time you meet a, a stranger. There's an entry phase, and then I'm gonna just double check here from my research. Um, there's an entry phase in which uh, strangers engage in a behavior called information seeking. <clears throat> and the information seeking at this stage is symmetric, right? So both parties are trying to find out are putting as much effort to find out about each other as, as the other. <clears throat> the next phase is called the personal phase, where they try and share information um, about each other to, to, to the counterparty and try and find uh, overlap. And then the, the last phase is the exit, uh, in which both parties now evaluate whether future interactions are desirable. And, and this is when they decide whether to meet again or not and deepen the relationship. So it's a kind of interesting framework to, to think about, um, especially when it comes to uh, community de design, right? So one, one of the, sorry, one of the, one of the, high, one of the conclusions they, arrive, they reach is that when uncertainty decreases, so does information seeking, okay? So that's gonna be useful when we look at this other paper that they based their research on, which was, um, a research of online communities on meetup.com with a physical component, right? So hybrid communities. So this paper was based, was done using the uncertainty reduction theory framework. So they interpret all of their empirical findings using that framework. Um, and, you know, these are some of the conclusions that they found, right? Um, so for example, uh, what, are the, what are the factors that cause newcomers to community to attend their first in-person meetup. Uh, and we know that attending in-person meetups in greatly increases the sense of belonging within a community. So it's an important plank in, in community building. So, you know, these are some of the, some of the features, right? Uh, for example, if the host of the uh, meetup has a photo, it results in a huge boost in attendance. And in general, the more information you give about an event, the more a newcomer is likely to, to attend. Uh, things like uh, inclusive words also boost. And also some interesting, slightly counterintuitive things, like if your event is hosted by somebody with high status uh, in the community, who is a leader in the community, it can actually cause a big drop uh, in newcomer attendance. So not an overall attendance, but newcomer attendance. Um, and that's due to a concept called social distance, where basically newcomers feel like they're not part of the in-group uh, and therefore are uh, uncomfortable or intimidated and, and less likely to attend. Um, so these are all, I think, very uh, relevant things when it comes to social token community building. Um, and so what does all of that have to do with, with um, you know, our project of social tokens. Um, I think these are some of the conclusions you can draw from the research, right? So supply lots of information uh, if you want people to attend both virtual and live uh, events. This, this goes back to uncertainty reduction theory. Uh, it reduces uncertainty and therefore increases um, attendance. Um, think about your group composition, right? Don't just have all people who have been OGs in that community for many, many years. Um, because that's going to reduce the chances of newcomers to join. Um, you can reduce social distance of hosts by doing things like direct outreach um, from the host uh, to the newcomers. Um, and the authors of the previous paper also place a big premium on 
uh, visualizing or surfacing commun community behavior. For example, if you show the number of RSVPs to an event, that itself increases the possibility of newcomers uh, then RSVPing to that event. Uh, and these forms of visualization can also help you to create the feedback loops so that you have the norms to enforce certain type of community standards. Um, so, so yeah, that was kind of my little uh, foray into um, some of this research. You can find all of this stuff on the Rally Medium with all the links, uh, and you can ping me on Twitter and Discord at uh, Jun Yen. I uh, would love to hear what sorts of research you would like me to delve into in future. Thank you very much. June, again, thank you. I mean, always a stellar presentation.